Thank you for coming out on this, what's turning out to be a beautiful Sunday. My name is Jessica Beck. I'm the chief curator here at the Andy Warhol Museum. And I've curated this exhibition, um, Andy Warhol Social Network, uh, interview television portraits. And Tyler Shine, our assistant curator, was part of this exhibition with me and also was pivotal in getting this program off the ground. So thank you so much, Tyler. Um, but we are here today to have an amazing lineup. And I'm so thrilled to have these guests with us in Pittsburgh. And so I'm just going to start out by reading their bios. But it's an exciting moment to celebrate this whole era of 1980s culture, life, music, interview magazine, all of these things that were happening in New York. So I'm really happy we're able to celebrate this year. And it was all organized and really put together by Adrian Loving. So I'm gonna start with Adrian's bio. Adrian Loving is a visual arts educator at Georgetown Day School in Washington, DC. Cultural historian and DJ, curating public programming, exhibitions, and performing internationally. His 2021 book, Fade to Gray, Androgyny Style and Art in 1980s Dance Music, focuses on the intersection of art, gender, and dance music. Adrian will appear in the forthcoming PBS documentary, Making Black America in fall of 2022. And the book is here with us on stage. Adrian will reference it, and it's also um, for sale in the shop, and Adrian's gonna be available afterwards to sign. Fred Brathwaite, aka Fab Five Freddy, Emerging in the late 1970s as a New York City graffiti artist who was one of the first to exhibit his paintings internationally. Along with friends and contemporaries Futura 2000, Keith Haring, Lee Quinones, and Jean-Michel Basquiat, Fab was a key player in New York's 1980s downtown cultural scene and instrumental in elevating graffiti into a disruptive movement that would eventually give birth to street art. In addition to his visual art, Fab co-produced and starred in and composed the music for the cult classic Wild Style and went on to direct music videos for numerous hip hop stars. From the late 1980s into the mid 1990s, he was the original host of Yo! MTV Raps, the groundbreaking MTV show that took hip hop culture global. Today he continues to make and exhibit his visual art and produce and direct projects for film and television. Rory Trafon is the nephew of Richard Bernstein and president of the estate of Richard Bernstein. The estate of Richard Bernstein is the heir to the legal rights and interests of the artist and the mission of which is to honor him by maintaining and enhancing his legacy and to make his art more accessible to audiences throughout the world. Rory formally created the estate in 2016. He has since produced the book Richard Bernstein, star maker Andy Warhol's cover artist, which is also for sale in the shop and will also be, Rory will also be available for signing and led the estate's business relations with museums, galleries, publishers, and licensing operations with brands such as Coach, Hansel Studio, and Flavor Paper. And so I just wanna give everyone a warm welcome to our wonderful panelists and enjoy the conversation. So thanks everyone, thanks for coming. Okay, good, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Jessica, for those great introductions. Um, glad to be sitting here with two legends. Um, so uh, I wanna talk a little bit about how this sort of came about and then sort of dive into a sort of free-flowing conversation. Um, the purpose of this talk is really to sort of look at uh, Warhol and Richard Bernstein and this sort of black celebrity image that uh, is something that I don't feel is very much talked about with regards to Warhol's work outside of Jean-Michel Basquiat and Grace Jones and some of the other people that are really well known, but there's a deeper history. Um, so with the book that I published called Fade to Gray, there's an essay called uh, Dance Electric, Warhol and the Black Celebrity Image. And I was really sort of inspired by just some things that I saw, but I was like, there's, there's more to the story here. It can't just be about Basquiat and Grace Jones. Like, let's really look a little bit deeper. And 
you know, I had an opportunity to go into the Warhol archives and spend several days just sort of digging. But I mean, you need months and years to really go through there and grab things. And um, I thought it was important to create some kind of scholarship um, and ask questions um, about this. So the, I'll, what, what we're talking about is kind of some of what the research revealed. Um, you know, and also I'm looking at it in the context of like, okay, well, I grew up seeing Warhol's work in museums for, for years of my life, but all I see is Marilyn Monroe or Liza Minnelli or, you know, the factory stuff. Like, where are these sort of black images at? There has to be some, so let's find them. Um, and so I, through the research, it revealed a lot. Um, the exhibition upstairs is fantastic. Um, there's lots of really interesting works. Um, there's works that I'd not seen before um, that Jessica and her team curated. So um, I really encourage you to see it and get the context. Um, so I wanna dive into that history and kind of talk to Rory and Fab about club culture, Warhol's engagement in like Studio 54, the Palladium, Mud Club, the whole art scene, how things have sort of changed. And, um, and also about art making, you know, what makes a strong image? What's an important part of a portrait? who gets to be in a portrait, and what does the portrait do for the artist's identity. So, um, Roy, I think I'm gonna start with you a little bit. Um, you know, the show has an incredible compilation of, the full, co the full collection of uh, Bernstein images from Interview Magazine. And, um, you know, most black celebrities of that time were probably on Blackbeat or Essence or Ebony. They weren't elevated with artwork to be in a, a magazine such as this. So I wanted to talk a, uh, talk to you a little bit about the selection process. Like, how does one get to be on the cover? What was the process? Um, did Richard have people he wanted to work with but didn't? And what was that creative process like? Sure, so uh, thank you for having me on the panel and talking about it. So, you know, at the beginning of Interview Magazine, Andy created in 1969, and it was, you know, very much like this underground sort of paper, right? And it was his entree into Hollywood. And when he brought Richard on in 1972, it was, you know, really like a seminal moment for Richard. And he had done some celebrity portraits of Danielle Luna in 1969. And he was very close with uh, Pat Cleveland and Beverly Johnson. So you see those beginning issues having Beverly Johnson and Danielle Luna. Um, you know, so it was really, at the very beginning, it was really like the social network of who they knew at the time. And then later on, when the colors got a little bit more vibrant, you could kind of see where Andy started to bring on Bob Colicello, Vincent Fremont, and this more of a, you know, business side of Interview Magazine. And I was, as it was getting more successful, then it became, okay, who's beautiful? Who's hot? Who's coming up? And, you know, Richard and Andy, they... They both loved Hollywood glamour, they loved beauty, and really it was just about the beautiful face and just who was like in the scene at the moment, and uh, Richard just created you know, beautiful imagery from there. Yeah, like as I walked through the show, and, and just for, through some of the works that I had seen outside of the show, um, you know, the faces don't get really dark <laughs> until like later in the series. Um, but then you have some people, like women of color, you have like Cher, you have uh, Bianca Jagger, you have these sort of people who sort of are in the, in the spotlight, but you know, look, seeing the Lisa Bonet cover really triggered memories of you know, a Cosby show, a different world. For my generation, like that was a very symbolic moment to see Lisa Bonet elevated, um, and even um, Eddie Murphy, you know, who, who really sits, sort of sits on this nexus of the, the 80s um, and what became huge celebrity film industry, for, especially for him being the biggest black star. Um, and, you know, why wasn't a Basquiat on the cover? You know, like he was really in the mix. Like what, what would be the reason he wouldn't be possibly on a cover? You know, it's a great question. And, you know, to be honest with you, I don't really have an answer for you as far as that. I mean, you know, I think from what a lot of people tell me that, you know, if you were having a movie coming out or, you know, something else, but I mean, Basquiat and Warhol, you know, they were very close, obviously. They had a great relationship, um, you know, up until a little bit at the end uh, with the last show that they had. But um, that's a great question why, you know, and there's only 12 months, I guess, out of a year. So there's only so many people you could really put up on there. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. 
Yeah, yeah, it kind of goes back to this idea of like, you know, was it a commercial impulse? Even the um, the Robert Townsend image was sort of interesting. Uh, that's one of my favorite images um, because as you see, he's holding credit cards. And during that time, he was finishing Hollywood Shuffle, but he finished it with credit cards. And so it, it sort of becomes more of a call to action. Like when you, it, it's beyond just a portrait. It's like he's, 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 act, he's working his, uh, his business and you see, you see it. You know, when you and I talked a while ago about the book, um, the first person you said was like Danielle Luna, like you need to know who she is. And I didn't know who Danielle Luna was, but you know, you've got Billy Blair in the early collages, you have uh, Diane Abbott um, and Beverly Johnson and Iman. Um, how, you, you said that he was very involved in this sort of model and uh, art scene with like Antonio Lopez. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I guess, you know, I'll talk about the history of Richard, really, and, and Andy in that relationship, and then I'll think, you know, it'll come to light, is that, you know, Richard had his first one-man show in 1965, and it was a great show, and uh, a writer for the Village Voice brought Andy to his show, and the two of them hit it off from there. And, you know, again, it was this, you know, love of old Hollywood and glamour and glitz that they just really, you know, like, hit the right notes on. Uh, Richard was also a very good-looking guy. Andy asked Richard to be in his movie, but uh, that's just a side note. Uh, he, that never happened, um, thank God. But um, so right after that, Richard went to Paris, and the pills that you see upstairs on the fourth floor, uh, he was doing with his art assistant, who was Paloma Picasso. Uh, and they were very much in the scene of you know the up-and-coming celebrities and models in that whole world and Danielle was one of those people who he met out in Europe. And he just got introduced to all these people along the way um, with Paloma and John Loring, who went on to become the creative director of Tiffany's for 30 years. Um, Danielle, and he met Beverly Johnson when she was modeling out there. And so, yeah, it was just, you know, the whole theme of this whole show is the social network, and they all just knew each other, and they all, you know, it was like a very small, tight-knit world, and. Uh, they just wanted to promote each other, especially in the beginning of interview. I thought something that was really curious too. I, I had to, when I started to think about Bianca Jagger a bit, you know, moving from this sort of Studio Fifty Four, you know, Chantus, you know, someone who is uh, in the in the papers, riding in on a white horse, um, you know, you start to develop this um, singular idea of this person, you know, as being this club girl, you know. And then I said, well, let me really think about her for a minute. So I did a little research and found out she got into activism. And, you know, she's Nicaraguan, you know, and how many Latina, you know, activists are, were talked about uh, or celebrated, you know, from, from sort of today's standards. You know, I think it's important to sort of take her out of the context of the club culture and look at her as, um, you know, uh, some, someone with a different kind of history post Studio 54. Um, and Fab, you and I were joking upstairs, and, and I said, you know, does she get a pass? I mean, does she pass in the sort of white club, you know, space? You know, did black people accept her? She wasn't on Ebony, you know? But what, what does someone like, um, in your mind, does a, um, a Bianca Jagger mean? What's her relevance? Well, you know, I became familiar with Bianca Jagger in the pages of interview, and I just knew her to be the the glamorous wife of Mick Jagger. Um, you know, the thing about Interview, there wasn't a great deal of content. It was just, but it was kind of radical in that it was really a lot of chit chat. Like um, when the, the, the person on the cover would be interviewed, usually at lunch by Andy and some of his, uh, his cohorts, it was amazing. Like you would be reading almost nothing a lot of times, which was really cool because all the other publications were full of all this information. So it was like, oh my God, this is so different. Because sometimes we sit around and just talk about not much of anything. But relating to Bianca, I didn't know she was an activist. I guess, I guess later I would, you know, I would see that she was involved in different issues. So. And you mentioned uh, working with Glenn O'Brien and writing a piece for an interview. Was it just one piece or did you write uh, other pieces? And what was that piece about? Well, my introduction to interview came just, I was still a curious kid um, at home in bed trying to figure it out. Um, the magazine was really just nothing. You know, magazines were the internet. For those that are too young to really remember a time before the internet, 
that's where you got all the information and all the cool stuff. And I was blessed to grow up in a household where my dad had subscriptions to a whole bunch of magazines and daily newspapers. Not interview, by the way, but that was just really striking. Richard Bernstein's covers were just really on the newsstand. It popped because nothing looked like it. Everything was a photo that had been retouched and all that other stuff. And so, um, but so you you know, I was very curious about Andy Warhol and this whole world art. I was just curious. But what really uh, drew me in closely was a music column in the back of interview called Glenn O'Brien's Beat. And so Glenn would write about every kind of music, funk, George Clinton, uh, punk rock, new wave, dance hall reggae. And so I began to read this guy's column and then I would pick up some of these records and his descriptions and um, analysis of these records was so spot on. And I became a huge fan of his column. Later meeting Glenn, he became a mentor to myself and also Jean-Michel when we were both trying to figure out how to be artists. And then I learned a lot more about Interview because in the beginning, as he mentioned when Interview started, I think in the late 60s, Glenn was the original editor. The idea was a radical, underground film magazine. It became a more glamorous kind of thing later. I think Andy having been shot and backed off from being in the midst of really wild, just anybody could have walked into the factory back then is what I was told and just hang out and do drugs or whatever was going on. So um, interview became a reflection of Andy changing his focus, doing s the celebrity portraits, et cetera. But he was a big influence on a lot of us. So, yeah, I was, was going to ask, uh, you know, where, sort of where did things start to change? Um, and, and this is something, a question for both of you. Um, you know, where's the line between um, the sort of black images being used um, to sell products versus um, the importance of having someone relevant on the cover? You know, uh, it's for me, it starts to raise questions about um, fetitiz fet fetitization. Um, you know, you had, during that time, you had Maplethorpe, you had Keith Haring, um, all sort of concerned with the black body and, and portraying it in the art world and also being in gay culture. Um, you know, was there a value or a street cred for Warhol to be making work using black people? Was it uh, a thing in particular he was going for, do you think, or was it just for the commercial purposes? Well, the way I looked at it, um you know, Andy had a lot of really cool, smart, connected people in his orbit, and they would be in his ear. So if they let him know, like, something cool is going on over here, if several of those people all mentioned, we had to a great party last night, this who was playing, this was the energy, this is what it was, Andy would, of course, want to go and show up and connect with who was making it happen. Um, I mean, you know, your question's about you know, who could, was on the cover, and sure, it would have been great to have more, a more diverse uh, look at the covers of Interview, but still, the, but there was coverage and attention paid, maybe not so much in Interview specifically, but Andy was definitely dialed in on what the cutting edge always was, and a lot of things that would, far from being acceptable, that are happening on mainstream, TV now, Andy was one of the first to really uh, put on a pedestal, so to speak, and to, you know, uh, big up, if you will, um, things like that. So. Yeah, I think um, really it was about, you know, beauty, you know, especially for Richard, you know, and I, I think probably Andy too, that, you know, whoever was really just beautiful. You know, I mean, if you've ever seen Beverly Johnson in person, I mean, you would want to put that woman on the cover of anything she, you know, she would say yes to. And same with Danielle Luna. I mean, a lot of people don't know Danielle, but I mean, she was one of the most beautiful women, you know, around. So I think, you know, for Andy and, you know, for Richard, who, you know, Richard had much less of a say of who got on the cover of Interview Magazine. You know, he was really just tasked with doing the illustrations for it. Um, but, I mean, there was one cover that, you know, he did really want, which was David Bowie, but that never happened. Um, but, um, but, yeah, I mean, aside from that, I think it was just really, like, the, the beauty that, you know, they wanted to capture and put on the cover and, uh, you know, pr 
promote each other. I think it's, it's important to point out that for those that don't know, Beverly Johnson and Danielle Luna were black models, they were black women that were coming up. Beverly, I think, was on the cover of some more kind of mainstream um, magazines, fashion, but, but Daniel Luna, De um, Beverly, and many other black women were featured in major runway shows. And, you know, I think it's a reflection of the fact that, you know, I'm gonna keep it 100. You know, there's a European standard of beauty, which was, has been forced upon folks. And that's what many people followed, what that European standard of beauty was. And there were changes and there were people coming that didn't fit that, that had to force their way in and make people change their ideas um, about that. Um, and so that was happening at that time. I think, and you mentioned Pat Cleveland, who was a black woman. She wasn't on the cover, but she was a very influential model. One of the reasons voguing became a big thing is the, the, the gay guys that went to voguing, a lot of them were, were imitating models like Pat Cleveland, who then was imitating what the voguing guys were doing. It just turned modeling all the way up. It put a lot of flavor into it, a lot of energy and excitement. And once again, Andy's radar was, he would hear and he would, he would want to be in the room. He would know like who was popping, who was hot. Um, and so that's that's yeah. interesting. Um, you know, speaking about um, the development of these sort of social networks, like being the architecture of it, um, and social climbing, this idea of like getting to know the right people. Who do I need to know? What's going to be the next step? Um, I, as I was reading through Star Maker, which is uh, the book on Richard Bernstein, really fantastic. Um, Roger and Mar Mauricio talk about um, uh, Richard's marriage to Barry Berenson. And Richard was, uh, would you say he was outwardly gay or people on the inside knew? I think people on the inside knew. I think, you know, it, getting back to it, I think Richard was fluid and he just, he loved men, he loved women, he loved more than anything just beauty, mm -hmm. right? And I think, so uh, Barry Berenson was a photographer for Interview Magazine. She was a really beautiful woman and, and very talented artist. Um, her sister was Marissa Berenson, who was one of the top supermodels of the 1970s, uh, Richard, and they were also the granddaughter of Elsa Scaparelli, who, very famous designer. Um, so, I mean, they were very much in that upper echelon of society people and the people that you would want to know and hang out with. Uh, Richard was engaged to Barry, uh, very much in love with Barry, um, but for Interview Magazine, um, they wanted her to photograph Anthony Perkins. And so uh, she had a very big crush on Anthony Perkins. And when she went out to California to go photograph him, that was the end of their relationship and uh, completely devastated Richard. Um, and then he still had, <laughs> Richard had to do uh, a cover of Anthony Perkins and Barry Berenson. I can't imagine how that must have made him feel <laughs> at the time. That's, that's probably rough. Um, but, um, but yeah, that was uh, that was their you know Richard's you know one true love, and uh, unfortunately Barry died on 9/11. She was on one of the planes that hit the twin towers, um, so it was uh, very very devastating for Richard yet again. And um, yeah, he writes about it in his diary about how you know broken up he was about that again. So. Wow. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I thought that was interesting to see how he was able to navigate and function. And he sort of went through a bit of depression after the, the <laughs> but it changed the work. Can you talk a little bit about how he went from the sort of um, uh, airbrushed uh, magazine covers, uh, the print, and in, in, into the more glossier illustration types? Yeah, I think, you know, after that, I, you know, it was really devastating for Richard, uh, obviously, uh, when she left him. But I think that also kind of made him focus a little bit more and kind of redirect his energy into his art. And he really did start to make these, you know, glossier, you know, imagery that you see up there starting around like 70, you know, four, 75, somewhere in there. And that's when you really start to see like the life and the DNA of Interview Magazine. And I think it was really through those experiences that that kind of came out. Yeah, I mean, those, for, as an artist myself, and I know, you, Bab, you, could probably uh, speak highly of just like the process of art making and like illustration and uh, what what are your thoughts on just like the strength of the work? 
you know, like I said, those those covers were there was nothing like them on the newsstand, so they always popped. The format of interview being this kind of oversized, uh, you know, periodical publication was unique. There was very little on the newsstand that was comparable, so it stood out. And then the way it was all laid out on the inside with that with those big photos, full page. It was just like, it was a really good look. It was breathtaking. And Richard's covers, like I said, was spectacular, outstanding, and just represented so much to me. Because, you know, I was just a kid looking at those magazines in the beginning. I guess late 70s is when it began to hit my radar. And then, you know, I had, I was like, once again, just curious about Andy, curious about, you know, what's, what is this all about? Who are these people? And so that was a little peak. It was almost like eavesdropping in some of those conversations and got a sensibility. But, you know, you also, like, I guess the whole club culture part, which I know you're going to get to, once again, for me personally, my dad, like I said, had a subscription to a lot of magazines. New York Magazine was one that we had a lot. And so some of the first articles about these cool clubs leading up to Studio 54, I wasn't on the scene yet, but places like Le Jardin, um, Haraz, other places that were hot, you they'd be mentioned in different articles. And that was the first time I actually read about Grace Jones as well, it was in New York Magazine. Then I'd later see them in interview or know that people from interview or Andy would show up at these parties. So then I began to get more of a sense that, you know, how dialed in, he always was. Going back to the 60s, obviously, some of the most cutting edge stuff, like the electric circus, the exploding plastic, and inevitable happened at these cool clubs that I just was like, man, I'd love to be old enough to hang out and go to these places. And then later I would get to go to these places and there would be Andy. Yeah, I feel like you were always sort of like, all city, you know, if you, you all know all city, it's like you work it from top to bottom, uptown, downtown, east and west. I always think Fat Five Freddy, he's all city, which few people get that title, okay? <laughs> and you're a graffiti artist, you started off in graffiti art, so like you earn that. Um, yeah, I definitely want to sort of like shift into club culture a bit more. Um, but one thing I was going to say was I, start, I started to think about how maybe interview might have influenced like the East Village Eye or the voice because you start to see these sort of electric pop art colors on the covers, you know, of these sort of zines in, in New York. Um, and I don't know, maybe it was in the early 80s that things started to change with, with those covers. Do you can, you, can you point to a change maybe? I mean, I can't specifically, but I would say the East Village Eye definitely was under the influence, yes. but definitely trying to do their own thing with some new wave punkish inspired imagery, um, but Richard had it on lock. Nothing came close to the to the way he would, you know, take a photo and just em embellish it with just these beautiful colors and just dramatize the whole thing. It just it always popped on a newsstand. Nice, nice. Um, so okay, talking a little bit about club culture. You know, we're looking at the sort of post disco. Um, yeah, late 70s, 80s, um, but moving into more of the, the 80s hip hop era, um, do you think there was a change in, in Warhol's philosophy about art making? Um, you know, you said, you mentioned that he had been shot. Um, and socializing with black talent that was different during the time of, say, Diana Ross, Michael Jackson, that studio, did things change in his, his uh, approach with, say, a Basquiat um, and, and those artists uh, during the 80s? Um, was is there a sort of a noticeable way that he started to interact with those with those those artists? Well, I mean, I think Andy, once again, having gotten shot and almost dying, ch changed a lot for him. Once again, the stories that I've heard about and read, anybody could have walked up into the factory, hung out, um, you know did drugs, dance, party, sex, drugs, rock and roll, like, the, like that all started at that time. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure Andy was plugged into anything hot and popping prior. I just, you know, based on the way the world was so segregated, especially in, in New York City culturally, I mean, in those certain clubs, definitely, but I'm sure, you know, I don't know if Jimi Hendrix 
in the 60s came through, but I'm sure Andy was, you know, plugged in, up on it, knew that he was, you know, best of the best. Um, you know, he knew, I'm sure he was plugged in on who was rocking the house, who was really putting the energy in the party. But then probably perhaps being a bit cautious at the same time, as he transitions out of the period when he backed off from being in the midst. But I'm sure he was clearly plugged in, because like I said, the way it would go down, Andy had really smart people around him that would let him know, like, that's pop, and that's what's going on. And then he'd lean into it him himself, and next thing you know, he'd be showing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a couple of pictures in the rotation of you and Jean-Michel and Andy. And I, I wonder what your role in the, these moments are. What are those conversations? What are you all talking about? Does he lean into you for advice? Are you privy to, are you, are you informing him about, okay, I know what's going on. You know, you know what are those conversations right. like? So perfect case in point. So one of those photos of me, Jean, and Andy, and then there's others that Andy took, was at the opening, the premiere screening of Spike Lee's first movie, She's Gotta Have It. And so, yeah, this is like a perfect example. So, you know, this is right at the same time when Jean and Andy had collaborated on a body of work. And so I knew that Spike Lee was this emerging filmmaker, and I knew, well, I'm in. You're in it, it, yeah. I'm of in course. the film for a brief second. Um, I'm one of the dogs. I, I tell this girl, hey, baby, come up to my house. Let's, let's do the wild thing. It's crazy. <laughs> He had a, Spike had these other lines for me. I'm like, Spike, that ain't me, man. But you know, I'm not gonna tell a girl, look, baby, I wanna drink a tub of your bath water. And I was like, Spike, like, what do you mean? He was like, you know, it's something you would say to a chick on the street. And I'm like, yo, hey, baby, come up to my crib. Let's do the wild thing. You know, it's just, but anyway, that's how I'm in, in this movie. Um, she's gotta have it, right? So I, I feel like Spike, I meet him and I know he is cool and the film I think is going to be a big deal. So I tell Jean-Michel, like, listen, you know, this young black filmmaker, this cat out of Brooklyn, like, like we are, um, we need to be there. So Jean is like, oh, yeah, yeah. And so the, 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 the day of the premiere, the screening, I call Jean and Jean's like, okay, cool. So come and meet me and me, you and Andy, like, let's go. And Andy was excited, like, oh, yeah, okay, let's see the film. And then... We all go to the premiere. It's actually a really famous photo. I'm trying to find the photographer to this day. If you Google myself, Spike Lee, Andy Warhol, Jean-Michel, there's a photo of all of us together in color. Every time I see Spike now, he's like, yo, Fab, we gotta find a photographer because we can't officially use this photo without like crediting the photographer. And the pictures emerged a few years ago, but nobody knows where the photographer is. So if anybody knows, let me know. But, um, and so Andy, so we all go to this premiere, and, and, and Andy was like, oh, wow, you know, he got it. You know, independent film, black and white, you know, this new kind of character, Spike doing this thing and whatever. And so then a few weeks after, I go, wait a minute, I've been, like, reading interview. I get it. You know, um, I knew Spike wasn't cover material. I mean, he's just, like, an emerging. But I call up. I ask to speak to Andy. I get Andy on the phone and I pitch him this idea to do uh, the interview with Spike Lee. So I've done about six interviews in Interview Magazine. Some of those covers that resonated to me, I know, I, I think those are the ones that I did these interviews for, but Spike was the first one. And then I suggested Robert Maplethorpe because he'd photographed black skin really well. And he was like, great idea, yes, ooh, <laughs> yeah. And I, I did, I interviewed Spike, an interview, and so that's a sense of how Andy would get plugged in. You know, he can't, you know, Jean Michel's like, oh yeah, this is it. We all went to the premiere, he saw the movie. Oh my goodness, yeah, you know, he was into it. And then I pitched that idea and it was in the magazine. So Wow, that's 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 amazing. And now are you were you conscious of your role as a connector? Um, you're 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 with Debbie Harry, you're doing uptown, downtown hip hop meets punk. You're in the clubs. You're, you're, you're an important person in in the whole DNA of this time and how people get to meet each other and connect. And not everybody's capable of doing it or comfortable doing it or being accepted in these different worlds. And it seems like you kind of do it seamlessly. I don't know, but 
at what point did you say, yeah, I'm kind of like making things happen here and people, business is getting done and things are getting done because I'm connecting people? Oh, well, I was a little more selfish. It was really just, <laughs> just you know, it, it, it as a result of, you know, me being in the mix and introducing like you to this person and then y'all go and do whatever and it, you end up here. I don't know, that happens independently, but it really was specifically I was definitely trying to find a lane for, for people coming from where I'm coming from to be able to get a, a place in this world to, to make our visual art. That was the initial thing. So when Jean-Michel and I became cool and, and got tight, we both had aspirations to have an impact on the popular culture. And it was going to be, once again, and Jean and I would jokingly say, we we both had the image of the Malcolm X poster of and the image of and the and the and the text was by any means necessary when Malcolm was looking out the window like with the shotgun, you know? And so we was like, yo, by any means necessary. And it, what that really meant for us was whether it's music, you know what I'm saying, whether it's film or or making art, which we both do, we gonna get in here. You know what I'm saying? So we was always into looking out how to, you you know, hook us up. Yo, 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 so and so is cool. Like we need to connect. Oh, this this person's doing this. It's a good look. Like they're open to what we're trying to do. So the connecting happened around that in that context, if you will. It wasn't like this is my job. I'm a connector. But it was like I was able to meet a a diverse group of people that were very supportive and open. Like Glenn O'Brien was key. Reaching out to Glenn and um, him embracing me and literally bringing me under his wing and, and he really connected me to key people. Here, I want you to meet Chris Stein and Debbie Harry. I want you to be a part of this TV show, which I'm gonna do, this public access show where I then met numerous other people. <laughs> and, you know, they were like, hey, well, what are you doing? I'm like, hey, I'm doing this new thing, uh, which, once again, you know, talking to my man Paradise a little while ago, this this thing called hip hop didn't really have a name. But I was telling people, there's, here's what's going on in the Bronx. I think this is just as unique and uh, interesting as the, some of this punk rock, because the energy was coming from a similar place. This rebellious, do it our own way kind of energy. And, um, they connected with that people that I was meeting through them, all the punk rock new wave people. And so, you know, then I brought a few other people to the table that was coming and they were open to hear this new music, to see this other people, you know, spray painting and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I think that um, what's, what, what I can appreciate even more, you know, looking at your work, and I don't know if you've seen Fab's music videos that he's directed, uh, Queen Latifah, was it you and ITY? Um, I directed Queen Latifah's first videos, Ladies First and Dance For Me. Ladies First, um, BDP, um, many, many... My uh, Philosophy. My Philosophy. Yeah, first but videos, yeah. The, the sort first of video for Snoop Dogg, too, by the way. What's my name? <laughs> <laughs> it's a um, bunch of them. <laughs> but, but I think what's great is the sort of black power impulse and the imagery can, can be creatively expressed through these artists, whereas maybe you weren't be able, wouldn't be able to have these revolutionary conversations with Warhol or that, that sort of scene, like can you talk about revolution with these sort of more white art groups, you know, or is it only reserved for your inner circles and your art, you know, in film and other things like that, you know? Well, once again, for me, what informed me, um, interview was a specific thing by the time I tapped into it, Richard Bernstein doing the incredible covers. It was a beautiful, a beautiful thing. But prior, the intent was a radical film magazine, underground films, and people doing really, you know, different things that were not mainstream. Even Andy himself is a filmmaker, and the, the films he was making were, were like radically different than, you know, these long takes, not editing, not, you know, not a lot of cuts, and just, it was very, very different and very, very next level. And so I knew that if you could f connect to the right people, they'd be open to some different, unique ideas. And once again, lucky for me, Glenn O'Brien was just like very receptive. Come on in, Fred. This is what it was. And this is what interview was like. In fact, Glenn had some early copies when I'd hang out with him. And that's right. That's where I first saw some of those early issues that are on exhibit upstairs. So once again, the idea that it was a radical underground film magazine, and then it be became this very glamorous thing later, 
but it was cool. And then Glenn was writing, and you know, they would interview other people doing different things. I mean, yes, 12 months, those covers, mostly beautiful model type, big actors, people with big movies. But in the magazine, there was some other relevant kind of edgy content about things that you wouldn't typically see in the New York Times or Life magazine or whatever was the mainstream People magazine. You wouldn't see these things in those publications at that time. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I want to move forward a little bit um, and be respectful for our time because we want to have some time for a Q&A with the audience. I know you guys have great questions uh, for, the, for Rory and Fab. Um, I want to talk a little bit about queer, queer culture and, 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 and trans culture and the work that the work in the social networks that uh, both Richard and Warhol participated in. Um, you know, Ladies and Gentlemen was a very important show uh, and body of work where there were uh, trans persons from the Greenwich Village gilded grape scene. Um, and also, uh, you know, Marsha P. Johnson is a subject. Um, and I know Richard participated in different queer scenes and created a lot of work. Um, you know, looking at where queer culture is now and, and the, the, the comfort to have these discussions, what do you think the value is of Richard's art and, and Warhol's art um, in, in, in being an important part of these discussions? So I think it was, you know, I mean, this real true acceptance of, you know, the queer art, the queer community and the trans community Richard made this beautiful portrait of Candy Darling, who was in the Warhol factory in 1969. And, you know, as far as I know, it's like one of the first real trans, you know, women who, I mean, he made her this ethereal goddess uh, hanging above the clouds with Candy Darling. And she died shortly after that. But, you know, Richard, you know, again, it was going back to, you know, this theme of beauty throughout Richard's life and, you know, the jewels and, you know, queer people and trans. It was just about beauty for Richard and just making them as beautiful as he most possibly can. But I think it was really a seminal moment too, you know, having some of these, you know, Candy Darling images he did in 1968. He did something of the Beatles. It was nude Beatles and it was just these like neon colors that you could kind of see with like the uh, pills upstairs as well. And it was, you know, this real like queer art that was never really seen before. He exhibited that in Paris, um, and a French judge actually had an injunction on the show, and they confiscated the prints. And you know, you're talking about you know Paris, France, and you know they're they're pretty loosey goosey, but uh, <laughs> you know not when it came to that. So um, yeah, no, it was it, it was pivotal. Did you want to add? Well, in? I just know that Andy embraced people that would just you know outside of what the mainstream of the popular culture would accept. I know in his films, he, he dealt with gay people, trans people, and um, some other aspects of underground, you know, gay life in New York. You would see these things in some of the films. And these things now, like mainstream TV, like, you know, Pose is, has people voguing and doing all these kind of things, and trans people are much more accepted. So Andy, once again, was really cutting edge in that regard in terms of really just going where other people were not comfortable to actually go and and putting a frame around those things and I guess helping other people accept other other different kind of lifestyles you know at that time I mean it's interesting for me once again with the whole club culture thing and the gay thing I remember you know being straight and growing up in Brooklyn it was very kind of homophobic is this how you grew up, like, you know, in the hood in New York? And I remember there was some friends that I was tight with that were telling me about this club in the village called the Paradise Garage. They said, man, the music is incredible. The DJ is next level. It's primarily a gay club. And I was like, what? But my boy also let me know, like, some real fine girls go there, you know? And I'm like, really? Like, what? But I'm like, let's go check it out, because they was down. I'm like, let's go put the homophobia on the side, and then went there. And you know, nobody was trying to come at you, whatever. All them like things you think about in the hood wasn't going on. 
But what was really cool for me, and once I realized, is when the girls that went there saw that you weren't homophobic and you was cool, and then when you went to dance with the girls, you know, you rubbing up on them, and next thing you know, the girls knew how you got down. Then when they saw you weren't really homophobic, the chicks were really cool, and then you got to meet some of the most cutting edge, just next level women. And so that was like a secret to the garage. <laughs> wow. Uh, and that's funny you say that. I mean, like, I, I also often wonder where the line is because you, you would have a Keith Haring who, you know, painted in the garage. And, you know, he that was kind of his playground. And, you know, Madonna might show up. Um, but, like, would a, a Warhol have been accepted there? Would he have gone there? Yeah, well, you know, Andy would show up. He wouldn't be on the floor dancing. But just the fact that he was there for those that knew meant that this situation has arrived. I mean, Andy's coming to check it out. If he's hanging out, he knew like, okay, this is a hot thing going on and I'm here. That was like, oh my God, Andy's here. It meant something to people that knew like, okay, we've, we've arrived, <laughs> you know. See, see, these insider perspectives I think are really important because I mean, I wasn't there, you know, you were there and you, I guess, I think it's important to really have this context as well in this story because you only get these sort of very narrow perspectives of how Warhol moves, you know, how, what he goes, you know, where he's showing up to party, where he's showing up to socialize. And some people may not put two and two together like this, you know, so thank you for being able to like shed, shed some light on this other dimension of him. Um, so I'm gonna ask each of you one more question and then we're gonna open it up to uh, the audience. Um, Roy, what's the value of Richard Bernstein's legacy? I mean, I know it's, it's immeasurable, but um, he's extremely talented. His work is iconic. Uh, it's influential. Young artists, young illustrators, young painters um, can look to his work for inspiration. Um, but what, what is it that you would like to see happen with, with, with Bernstein's legacy? So I think, you know, for me, um, you know, and you know, I really just knew Richard as an uncle who happened to be an artist, not an artist who was an uncle. And, uh, you know, growing up, I grew up with, you know, his art all around my house. I had the nude Pat Cleveland uh, in my house. So that was really fun growing up. But, um, um, you know, I think, you know, for Richard, he really captured the cultural zeitgeist, just like Andy did, right? And you know, even though he wasn't necessarily responsible for who managed to get it on the cover of Interview Magazine, what remains today is this social document of who was important in our time. And, you know, he really captures that moment of the 60s with what I was just saying with Candy Darling and the New Beatles and the 70s and 80s. And in the 80s, he was doing work on the computer. And he was one of the first pop artists working on a computer with something called the Quantile Paint Box. That um, cover I mentioned with David Bowie, who he really wanted to have on the cover, um, he created on a computer in 1983. And it appeared in his book, Megastar in 84, that Andre Leon Talley wrote. Um, and so, you know, what I want, you know, really the world to kind of know is, you know, how influential he was. And, capturing that social zeitgeist uh, of that whole pop art era. Yeah, I think, I think that's very important to uh, keep him in, in the frame of reference for everyone. And, and, and as, as I had mentioned earlier, I mean, I'm a DJ. I've been collecting records for like most of my life. I have like 10,000 records and my friends have records, my other DJ friends. And like there's a sort of spirit of Richard Bernstein that lives in people's collections and in record stores. So, if you never saw an interview magazine, Richard lives in people's houses. <laughs> you know, they live in people's collections. And, and I think that's also another interesting um, market to sort of think about is, um, you know, the DJ culture, the record collector aspect of Richard, you know, and what those records mean, you know. Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, you know, he and Grace Jones were, you know, truly best friends. And Richard was godfather to her son. I mean, they were tight. And, you know, Richard did most of her album covers up until Richard introduced Grace to Jean-Paul Goud, who, you know, she got married to. I guess that's a theme in Richard's life, I guess. <laughs> you should really stop introducing people together. <laughs> but, um, but no, absolutely. I mean, and he did so many other album covers for First Choice, Black Souls that you see up there. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. That was a big part of uh, Richard's legacy and, and his life, too. 
Does anybody have Richard Bernstein album covers at, in the audience? Yeah, okay. Do you want to say something? I just say, once again, it's just so great. I just literally, it was a joyous moment to walk through the exhibit, look at those covers, just so exciting. And then also, the, the DJ set last night, which you and some other people. Jasonic like, and yeah, it's my. Yeah. Thank you. Really recreated that kind of energy of that club. It was really great. Uh, it was a magic moment last night. He's pretty good on the wheels of steel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know you all know all the Grandmaster flashes. That's not me, but um, I try to throw a little fab cut in there. I don't know if anyone heard it, but uh, yeah. from Wild Style. Well, it was a nice set. You did your thing. Thank you. I'm honored. Like I, Jamil, we, we, we got Fab like bigged us up, so we're good. Um, so um, I'm gonna end with you, Fab. Um, how how did this era really shape like who you've become now? Um, you know, when you think about your own work and your own uh, creative projects, um, like what do you take away from this and your experiences with Andy? Well, you know, it's interesting. So one of those images that you. Is up there. I go. Oh boy, um, <laughs> was a shot of Andy and 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 Miles Davis. Yeah. And as a younger kid, seventies, early I don't know, whenever it was, one Sunday magazine, one Sunday in the New York Times magazine, there was an ad. I believe it was for Braniff Airlines, and it was an illustration of these various people very prominent people all on an airplane together. And it was um, Muhammad Ali, it was this one, that one, maybe Pablo Picasso, it was Miles Davis, and there was this guy, Andy Warhol, who I didn't really know who he was. And I remember looking at this going, who is this guy, you know? And it just was a very curious, standout look. And then I would later learn, but I, like, I kind of come from a jazz background, because my dad, hung out with Max Roach, Miles Davis, Delonious Monk. That was my dad's era coming up. I would hear that music all the time. So Miles was cool in, in the household. And then seeing him in this photo with Andy, then later getting curious and then stumbling onto pop art and deciding, like, you know, looking at this guy who would emerge in all this unique cultural spaces. And then at a point, I decided, having done graffiti, I wanted to make art, and that pop art stuff was a big influence on me. So it was just exciting to be able to then get to meet him and other players and get to figure out a way to express myself and to find people that I was able to convince to embrace not just what I was doing, but a whole movement that was developing coming from these outer reaches. And it was just a fascinating journey. And interview was a big inspiration. Um, in fact, my first time in the magazine, Dave LaChapelle, the photographer, his first paid photo shoot was doing a piece on East Village artists' portraits, and I was one of the portraits. And later, when David blew up and we'd see each other, he'd say, Fab, do you know that was my first paid gig, Andy? That was my first paid work as a photographer. So it all interconnects in a nice way, and I'm really blessed and thankful that I've been along for the ride, and the best is yet to come. Wow, thank you. Yes, give him a hand. And you're a real treasure, Fab. Like, you're like an American treasure, I think. Like, you, have, you sit on so much information. Um, and I guess in my last little words on this before I turn it over is, um, you know, I think I really challenge you all if you're really interested in, in discovering Warhol's uh, more interesting sides in terms of black black subjects. Um, you know, as you can see here, he Pele, you know, O.J. Simpson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Prince, like all these people. I didn't know he did these, and then I was like, okay, we need to really dive in and see what this guy is all about. So um, I I challenge you to um, to go in and really um, do some more research around Warhol. Um, so I'd like to open it up to some questions, and um, Jessica is going to yeah. sort of... I, I, I'll take the microphone and I'll pass it around, but I just first wanted to say thank you so much. This Fab, you just brought it all to life and gave it such an energy, so I feel like we're all so lucky <laughs> to be here. And Rory, we've, I've personally had your like, living you know, through Richard experience, so that's lovely to see up here on the panel too. And I just wanted to say one thing about the Basquiat question, Adrian, that you brought up, like why didn't he make it on the cover? 
I think the really fascinating thing about Basquiat in this moment, he's actually getting the limelight in the art world that Warhol had wanted. So, you know, the photo of him looking at the cover of Basquiat on the cover of the New York Times magazine was like a big deal that Warhol didn't have. So, um, and then he makes it an art forum and this beautiful spread of the radiant child was the article. So the other thing is he shows up in the magazine twice in the interior, but one of the interviews is with Emile D'Antonio. And Emile D'Antonio was the first person to go into Warhol's studio in the 60s and say, you shouldn't paint with this drip and this brush stroke, you should paint with the clean line over the Coke painting. So he also makes the painter's painting a documentary of the New York School in the 1960s. So it's almost like Basquiat was being positioned with the art world with Warhol. So it's, um, you know, somehow he didn't end up on the cover almost because his cachet is in the, the high circles. You know, Mary Boone, he sells out his Mary solo show at Mary Boone, which also, also I think Warhol was quite envious <laughs> of all this attention that Basquiat was getting in the inner art world, in the gallery world in New York, because Warhol's kind of waned out of popularity in the New York gallery scene at this point. So I just wanted to bring that up. And also the Village Voice reference, John Wilcock, it was his idea originally, Interview Magazine. So he's the editor that founds the Village Voice in 1955, and there's actually a lawsuit um, in the 70s over it. But anyway, so it's just another fact that Warhol's in the know, <laughs> always taking kind of somewhat uh, other people's talents on board. So we had a question right here. Uh, peace and blessings, everybody. It's a blessing to be here, especially with my brother Paradise, man. It's good to see you. A legend in the hip hop game, if y'all don't know, pay That's respects right. to him. Right, 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 right. Much respect. So um, we have two icons from Pittsburgh, right? We have um, Naomi Sims, one of the first black supermodels, and then we have um, the great um, Betty Davis, who just passed away. If y'all don't know, they honored her at the Grammys this past year. Did they play a part in this scene with you guys? Because I know they both went to New York and became famous in New York after they left Pittsburgh. Betty Davis, the, the former wife of Miles Davis, she yes. would have been perfect in interview. I don't know if she ever was, you know, prior to me being aware of, uh, focused on it, but she was a big uh, crush for me <laughs> as a growing teen. You know, that was like hot pants. The first woman I saw in hot pants is Betty Davis. And then it became a style, so she was just everything, looking at that album. Uh, hey guys, um, I had a question uh, for Fred. Um, you, Adrian described you accurately as a connector. Do you think the fact that Andy had been trans, had crossed through so many different worlds from kind of this very waspy, almost Calvin Klein-y, you know, patrician beauty, you know, Euro as you said, European standard of beauty, all the way to hanging out with Basquiat and the downtown kids and the punk rock new wave who were almost anti-glamour in their aesthetic. And then hip hop, which was also very DIY and glamour was not a thing that was even afforded to young poor black kids from Brooklyn or uptown. The fact that Andy was able to keep his hand in all these places and still remain himself, do you think that made you all kind of kindred spirits in your ability to, to just be in all these different spaces and still remain you know, true to your own identity? Well, I think to a certain extent, but um, the thing, everything in New York changed because when this, like, I didn't do the Studio 54. I wasn't in the mix at that time, but that was, like, the, the hottest situation. You'd read about it everywhere, news clips about Studio 54, the whole doorman who would pick people to come in and everything. So when we got it popping on the downtown scene, particularly at the Mud Club, we did a did an opposite version of that where the people on the door were not letting in people that showed up in limousines that looked like they'd been to Studio 54. They was letting in all the artists. I remember I could pull up, maybe like, hey, Fab, how many? I'd be like, oh, I got like six people from the hood. Come on in. And it was like, I was, you know, I'd walk, I remember one time they let me in and like Halston was waiting outside to get in. I was like, yo, this is crazy. So... <laughs> It was definitely a change into the guard, but then it just, like, people were just making things that resonated, and, you know, I guess people like Andy and people that were really truly tastemakers realized, like, this is where it's at right now. Like, that scene up there is played out. 
and this is where the energy is. Because once again, I knew Andy had a lot of cool people around him, and I got to meet some of those people, Ronnie Catrone, Paige Powell. It was different people that were connected. And next thing you know, Andy would show up, and it would, he, would, he would bless the situation. And it was also an indication of the changing, kind of like a cultural shift, so to speak. Was it, with, that was indicative. And then when he started collaborating with Jean-Michel, that was just next level. So next level cool, you know, so he really tapped in to what was going on. Hi, um, I'm really interested in how um, it's almost as though even predating, I mean Warhol was, was copious documenter, but hip hop culture, even, even disco culture to a large extent, was all about documenting itself in some interesting way, whether you're looking at August Darnell and all of the Kid Creole legacy and that sort of text, but to, to talk about Glenn O'Brien and the proximity and the humor in documentation, because everything everybody was doing had a sense of humor about it, and the sort of watching, when you go back and watch the text, it's a text now of Glenn O'Brien's TV party, it was everybody just hanging out doing their their damn thing on a Queen's television station. Whereas August Darnell was much more copious about the sort of documentation in, in the, the whole body of Kid Creole. But can you talk about humor and documentation? Well, I guess, I mean, <laughs> you know, a sense of humor was a big part of it all. Um, various levels of people that had a sense of humor, tongue in cheek, definitely a part of, of a lot of what was going on. But I just really want to just also mention something about disco because Paradise, we had, a, we had lunch a little bit before we came, and a lot of people don't fully understand that, you know, hip hop was built on this thing that happened called disco before it became not the disco that was a big commercialized industry with Studio 54 and everything. Before that, it was black and Latino mobile DJs in New York that went around with their sound systems. This is the beginning of it all, including this guy named Pete DJ Jones, and there were a, a dozen or so other disco DJs that inspired what became known as hip hop. So in the beginning, every other group was disco this, disco that, disco so-and-so was a big inspiration, but another form of disco, not the commercialized Saturday Night Fever thing. I just like to point that out. But yeah, a sense of humor was rampant throughout a lot of the culture. I can represent my man Paradise, yes indeed. Um, so I was actually in New York recently and there was a great exhibit at the Museum of the City of New York about the music scene in the 80s. And that exhibit seemed to really, I guess, lay the demise at the, at the hands of Ed Koch and the, uh, the cabaret law enforcement. And I was wondering if you could talk about that and how the city maybe helped or maybe didn't. Yeah, well, it, it was, that's a, oh boy, the cabaret laws. I became aware of cabaret laws, unfortunately, during the Giuliani administration. And what Giuliani did um, was, a lot of horrible things to the nightlife and the party life in New York. Like cabaret laws, a lot of them were racistly enacted um, and the things that were to control who could play at different clubs and whatever and a way to take away your ability to play at different clubs. Anyway, there were laws that Giuliani enacted where like if you were at a bar that didn't have a cabaret license, which really was a license to, to like dance, if you was just moving your head, I remember people coming up to me saying, please Fab, I hate to say this, but if you move around like that, they can come in and take away our cabaret license, which meant they wouldn't be able to sell liquor. It would just shut the place down. So that happened during the Giuliani administration, and that took a lot of the fun out of just the ability to have fun in New York and just put on some music and dance. Change the scene. Um, it was a tr complete change in everything that never really came back, because then as the rents got super high, nobody could afford to live there. Clubs couldn't, you know, the places that did there were everything just went away. It all changed. So we don't like those guys. <laughs> so when it comes down to representation from Interview Magazine, 
for example, in the case of Danielle Luna, she appeared first in Vogue magazine, and three years later is when, uh, when she appeared on Interview magazine. What is the approach of Interview when it has been already in like a big fashion magazine? How do they? What was their process like to make it unique and different? Yeah, so I guess, you know, uh, it, you're right. So 1966, she was on the cover of uh, British Vogue. And, you know, Andy, you know, like Fab was saying too, you know, he was always at the forefront of the cultural zeitgeist and, you know, trying to, you know, propel kind of his voice and as this kind of like cool, you know, sort of thing. So, you know, I think bringing someone like Danielle Luna and, you know, you had mentioned Naomi Sims, who is, you know, 1973, you know, one of the very first issues when they brought Richard on. You know, it was like this very cool scene to be on interview and they just wanted to, you know, kind of create this sort of like cool moment. And yeah, I don't think it was really like out there. It was like kind of more on the ground. Yeah, I think that Andy was just responding. You know, also, you know, understanding the the sad legacy of American racism, it didn't exist in the same form in Europe. So what you would have is a lot of European designers that just loved the flavor of certain women and didn't look at them, oh, she's black, just something unique, a token. It was just like, oh, this one's hot. I want to feature her. She's going to be the main girl in my show. I'm going to give her a good spotlight. And so that had a big influence as well on... Andy and other people, because you would get to see these women featured in Europe um, before the fashion scene became as strong runway wise in America. The whole shows that happened in New York weren't as big and prominent. It was more about Paris and what was going on in like Milan, I guess. And when you'd see these images, you'd see tons of women of color, very diverse spectrum of women that you did not see in America, but that, that eventually did change somewhat, so. And Japan, too. And Japan. Yes. Because Grace uh, was one of uh, the first people to model, and black models in Japan, and Beth Ann Hardison, and, and, and those, those, those guys. Yes, Beth Ann. Yeah. <laughs> um, other questions? Anybody else want to? Oh, OK, a couple more up here. And I also just wanted to bring one point to that, too. The other component of the exhibition that isn't necessarily part of our talk today is the television series. And the first season was just called Fashion. So, and the first few episodes are literally just a makeup tutorial. <laughs> They're actually very incredible because now they look like YouTube videos. But, um, and then there's just full episodes of runway footage. And the people in Warhol's social network in the 70s are Halston and Bianca Jagger, who were, you know, Halston's revolutionizing the American fashion scene. And he was known for Pat Cleveland as being one of his Halstonettes. So in terms of like an American designer bringing in models of color, Halston was one of the first to do that. So Warhol, like as everyone has been saying, is very connected with a pulse. And it happens not just in the magazine, but in the television. And there's a crossover between both of those media. So um, there's a question in the back. And we might just take, so think of your other questions, or you might just take two more. So. Hi, um, I got here a little bit late. I was checking out a guitar trade show. Um, I just moved back to Pittsburgh. Um, I lived out in Hollywood for about 10 years, Manhattan before that. And then in 2020, I went back to Manhattan. And you're right, it's like completely changed even for somebody who was born in the 90s. <laughs> um, what is your best word of advice for somebody like myself who is autistic as well? Um, and like, because Andy was autistic. And um, I guess like, getting connected. Like musically, I'm like Velvet Underground meets Lady Gaga. I go by Lady Lala and the Spiritual Shakedown as soon as I find a band here in Pittsburgh. <laughs> um, that's why I was at that convention to try to find guitarists. But what would you say is your best word of advice for somebody like that in 2022, like today? Who's your question anybody? directed to? Oh. Specifically in the middle. So can anybody. I ask you, what do you mean when you say, what's your advice like in terms of networking or? Yes. Okay. Um, in the spirit of community and in the spirit of uh, being open to uh, different styles and people and communities, um, I, I would say just, you know, try to network as best you can and, and, and be honest about what you're trying to share. You know, I think if your goal is to uh, be known as a musician or an artist, um, be with like-minded people, 
do be DIY. You know, that scene was all about DIY. I mean, no one was getting paid at that time. You guys were all doing it to because you loved it. Um, you know, just be about your work. And I think people will start to come around you, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, back in, in the days in New York, pre-internet, you just went to the physical space where you might find like-minded people, connect, mix, mingle, et cetera. So much of everything happens online. That's not always the best way. It's a great way to get information, but it can be very superficial. So I don't know if there's a scene here where the real cutting edge artists are, but if you can connect with them, that's a good place to start. And then there will be time at the book signing and things like that to ask questions. So um, let's take a look. Hello, thank you all three of you. This has been a really great evening for me. Um, we talked a lot about, or you talked a lot about connection and, you know, uh, Andy being inspired by people and connecting those people, and you, you did it yourself. Is there someone now or a feeling or an artist, whether that's a musician or a painter, that's been uh, inspiring you or you've been looking into recently or chasing after, interested in? Bab? <laughs> wow. Um, you know, when I'm asked questions like that, I'm going to be honest, it never really comes right to me. And then, 10 minutes after this, I'll be like, ah, oh, man, this cat and that cat, you know. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, you mean musically or visual art? Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> Kendrick Lamar comes to mind, um, who's just unique and interesting uh, and smart, which is usually goes along with you know, being able to s sustain something special and be able to say no to certain things and then do certain things and just, he's definitely seems to continually resonate. There's many others, unfortunately, if I had a little prep time, I'd have a little list to rattle off of uh, artists that I think are doing the right thing and influential. But I just think a, a hard thing to do, even the way Kendrick will just take himself off out of the digital mix and you don't see him tweeting or popping up on social, and then it's time to drop a new project. I think that might be some of the hardest stuff to do for anybody creative right now, because as soon as something looks a little bit interesting, people want to push it all the way out there. And I think in relation to hip hop, and, uh, and, and it, it had such a long time to develop and grow for its roots to go down in all aspects of it, and so it's why it's so resilient, I think, because so much happened before it got exposed. It got to develop. It got to really figure out how to be what it is on its own terms without a, too much money being thrown at it too early. And so that you can compare to other scenes that have developed. Go back through history. There's typically a period of time where things get to develop before they get co-opted and get saturated with with too much capital that can be kind of detrimental if you don't know how to manage it. Yeah, um, I would say, I don't know that there's any artists in particular, but <clears throat> I tend to be a little bit more uh, nerdy and reflective about time periods and the way people connect. Um, so I, I think a little bit more about um, how can we retell the story or how can we dig for a different perspective about this particular artist or this particular art movement or music movement or what have you. So. There's so much noise out there right now. Like I'm, I'm sort of less interested in like, oh, this person or that person, but more like, what does all this mean, and how do we make sense out of it in a different way? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I'll just add to that too. I think you know, getting back to Andy Warhol, right, and and Richard, you know, they were always at the forefront of technology, like silk screening and this automation thing that you know Andy wanted to do, and you know Richard with the airbrush and then computer generated work. And you know, I think what you're seeing now with you know this digital artwork and you know NFTs. I mean, most of it I think is probably not great, but I think the people that you'll see survive are probably like you know really like that new generation of like really creative geniuses that'll you know will be you know knowing their names you know uh, 20 years from now. But uh, you know, so yeah, K yeah. Kendrick's last video used. Deep fake, something I know Andy would be fascinated. Richard as well, 
and Kendrick used deep fake technology in his last music video where as he's rapping, his face is it's sort of like morphing, but he's turning into these other artists. He turns into Will Smith, he turns into Nipsey Hussle, and it's really powerful because the, the lyric is as if he's speaking to their situations, of course, the obvious with Will Smith, and with Nipsey, it's like Nipsey's speaking to his kids and is, is just really powerful, but it's, it's really Kendrick, and it was a really amazing use of that technology, and I'd like to just say, when I directed Snoop's video, I used morphing to turn him into a, a dog, so <laughs> I was pretty cutting edge at the time, I'd like to say. <laughs> Um, I think we're going to wrap here. Um, I want to thank my amazing panelist, uh, Rory Trafon. Um, Rory, what's, how can people find out more about uh, Richard Bernstein's work? Uh, so my website, richardbernsteinart.com, uh, my Instagram, Richard Bernstein Art, and yeah, Star Maker, obviously. Mm -hmm. Richard Bernstein wallpaper, let's make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> And Fab, how about you? It's, oh, I'm on social, you know, Fab Five Freddy. <laughs> he ain't hard to find, right? <laughs> on the gram, Fab New York, Twitter, you know, the usual stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Fab has such work to, you'll spend the rest of your life trying to, like, learn about. So thank you both so much. Thank you, Adrian. And thank you to a great audience. Um, we'll be outside. Um, you can get... Richard, Richard Bernstein's Star Maker in the bookstore, which is a really fantastic book. I've been looking at this for a long time. And I'll be signing copies of Fade to Gray, which is also available in the, uh, the bookstore. So thank you all. And breaking news, Rihanna will be headlining the Super Bowl halftime show. What? <laughs> <laughs>